So the time has come to kill off our cell and also to explain all what all those arrows that pointed to apoptosis in previous lectures were actually pointing to. So what it, when it comes to cell death, there are at least two completely distinct pathways, um, one of which necrosis is associated more with accidental death, um, trauma, or in some cases cell starvation. And what happens in that case is ultimately lysis of the cells that produces and potentially a very serious inflammatory response and is very antisocial as far as the neighbors of the cell are concerned. But what happens is the cell expands first. And I tried to indicate that the organelles, mitochondria, which started out looking like this, the nucleus, they kind of squish out and then ultimately lyse themselves so that everything within the cell is eventually exposed to the cell next to it. And I point that out because the, essentially the point of apoptosis is to prevent that kind of thing from happening. And it is not uh, generally associated with accidental death. It's the result, when things go right, of specific signals or more likely the withdrawal of specific survival signals that then kick in this pathway. So it's quite a bit distinct by appearance from necrosis, and that distinction is what lent the name apoptosis to the overall process. It translates loosely into falling away the way leaves fall away, although that seems to me a real stretch. Uh, but in any case, the idea is that uh, everything that happens in apoptosis is designed, A, to minimize the damage to neighboring cells and B, recycle as much of the material from the cell as can be recycled. So what happens instead of the uh, necrotic swelling of the cell is a shrinking of the cell. The nucleus shrinks as well and then eventually fragments and the chromosomal DNA within the nucleus fragments. And I'll show you what that means in just a second. And you might have already seen the ladders that are associated with apoptosis. Unlike the case with necrosis, the organelles remain intact. And the beauty of that is that if another cell comes along and swallows the mitochondria, it can just reuse it. It can just recycle it. And that's exactly what happens. So you get cytoplasmic blebbing, which is distinct from this budding uh, phenomenon. This blebbing is designed to encapsulate the cytoplasm, the nucleus with the fragmented DNA, and uh, provide a means by which that material can be recycled, and the way it's recycled is by a phagocytic cell coming along and eating it. So these things that are being eaten from the original cell that underwent programmed cell death are referred to as apoptotic bodies. and they are uh, essentially what's left of the cell before it gets eaten and its contents recycled. And what I've drawn is really the most dramatic um, observed form of apoptosis. The truth is that it's often the case that you can look at a cell that's undergoing it and not even be able to tell. And for a long time, apoptosis completely escaped the attention of uh, cell biologists. But the uh, the solution to the mechanism of apoptosis was um, not entirely established with C. elegans, but C. elegans studies certainly advanced the field more than any other experimental organism. So this is uh, what that uh, nematode looks like. And what I consider to be one of the coolest figures in all of biology, this is the uh, complete fate chart of all of the cells in the adult worm. 
there are a little over a thousand such cells and because the uh, C. elegans is transparent you can see them all if you look carefully enough and Sidney Brenner in particular looked carefully enough uh, such that it was possible to chart the fate of every one of the cells beginning with the zygote and the significance of that as far as apoptosis is concerned is that in going from zygote to adult a little over 100 cells form and then die and it's exactly the same hundred and something cells that die so it's clearly the case of programmed cell death death happening on purpose and because the genetics of C. elegans are really nice to work with it was possible using the system to isolate mutants in that process in which case the phenotype is just those 109 cells or whatever don't die. The uh, adult still lives with those cells and you can count them and therefore detect mutations in the cell death pathway. Those mutations in C. elegans were uh, given the abbreviation cell death, CED. The first two that were discovered of importance, the so-called CD3 and 4, those were uh, genes that mutations that inactivated them led to the survival of those hundred and something cells. So inactivating those cells um, caused them to live. That indicates that th these genes are what we refer to as pro-cell death. They would be responsible for triggering the steps that lead to programmed cell death. Another important mutation was CED9. In this case, the gain of function dominant mutation in CED9 had the same phenotype as 3 and 4. And other studies with uh, co uh, dual mutants containing either 9 and 4, 9 and 3, were able to establish that CED9 works upstream of 3 and 4. And because it was a gain of function that has the same phenotype as a loss of function, once of these, we can conclude that CD9 is a pro-survival gene. Never mind that so much, but the, the, the reason that this became very important to people other than those studying worms was some uh, sequence similarities between the gene products of these genes and uh, mammalian, i.e. human um, genes and their gene products. So CD3 was established to encode an enzyme that's referred to as caspase, that's cysteine aspartate protease, that in uh, humans at that time was called ICE, interleukin, interleukin I think, uh, converting enzyme. So that was a protease that was of interest only to a few people that studied interleukin processing. Uh, but the real interesting uh, homology was between CD9 and this protein BCL2, that stands for B cell lymphoma number two. So B cell lymphomas of this variety arise because this gene translocates from a region where it is highly controlled into the worst possible region, which is in the immunoglobulin uh, gene cluster. Those genes are expressed like crazy. So as a result of the constitutive high-level expression of this gene in those uh, types of chromosomal rearrangements, uh, you get the cancer, this B-cell lymphoma. So the fact that this uh, worm gene is related to a very, very important cancer susceptibility gene just made this whole topic extremely high profile. and the genetics and cytology work that was done by Brenner and his um, colleagues led to Nobel Prize relatively recently um, for their work and they definitely deserved it. But so that uh, this pathway seems to indicate that it terminates at caspase and that's exactly right. So what we have to do is figure out how it is that activating a caspase will lead to all of those things, the, the blebbing, the nuclear fragmentation, the chromosomal fragmentation that we associate with uh, 
the, the microbiology or the, the microscopy of apoptosis. So I'll do that in the next video and then basically work backwards through the observed properties of apoptosis to get to the regulation because it's much easier to understand if you do it in that order.